Jesus speaking, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience possess your souls. So we're going to look at a cheery little passage tonight, word of encouragement. I especially love the scripture, verse 17, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. That's in my promise box at home, and I take it out every once in a while. Actually, what we're looking at here are the conditions that are going to be in existence uh, in the time that is prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus has been, been giving a preview concerning those conditions that will prevail prior to his second coming. When we looked at verses 8 through 11 here in uh, chapter 21 of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus began to speak concerning things that would be in existence. He spoke of false teachers. He spoke of wars. He spoke of catastrophes. As he's, and he also spoke of cosmic signs. And, and all of these, he said, would mark the conditions in existence prior to his return. In the verses that we're looking at tonight, verses 12 through 19, Jesus is speaking concerning conditions that those apostles who are alive at that time are going to experience. These are things that he's preparing these people uh, to be aware of. And he begins to inform them that they're going to experience terrible persecution for their faith. Now, that's something that as you study the Bible, you discover began early in the history of the church. All you need to do is look at the book of Acts. And if you began to do just a, just a short um, overview of it, you would see that the history of the church in the book of Acts is an interesting history. When you look at chapter 1 in Acts, you see that that is a, a chapter that basically records the events following the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, uh, you see that Jesus uh, gives commandments to the apostles and, and then begins to instruct them concerning the promise of his Father. And they're to wait. And as they wait for this promise, chapter 1 tells us that they fellowship with one another, that they prayed in, and they waited on that promise. And as they were waiting on the promise, then a new apostle was selected to take the place of Judas, a man by the name of Matthias. And so you see the beginning of the church in chapter 1 as they're awaiting the promise. But when you get to chapter 2, when you get to chapter 2 in Acts, it speaks of the day of Pentecost and how that promise of the Father was fulfilled and how the church came into existence. It was birthed. There were 120 disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem, and they were baptized by the Spirit of God, and they received the gift of tongues, and they began to proclaim the mighty works of God. And we know that when we look at Acts chapter 2, that these 120 spilled out of the room that they were in, and, and people began to hear the praise uh, that they were giving, and, and they started hearing the Word of God as it was being preached. And, and as this is all taking place, the Apostle Peter begins to preach a message, and 3,000 people were added to the church that day. Later on, we see in chapter 3 that Peter and John were in the city of Jerusalem. They went to the temple at the hour of prayer, which was 3 o'clock. And while they were there, there was a crippled man at the gate called Beautiful. And as Peter and John began to walk into that gate, Peter, looking down at this man, said to the man, look at us. And Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, says that the man looked up, expecting to receive something. And as he looked at the apostle Peter, the apostle said something like, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say unto you, rise to your feet and walk. And the Bible tells us that the apostle Peter, reaching down, takes the man by the hand and begins to lift him up. And the man receives strength in his ankle bones, his legs. He begins to walk. He begins to leap. He begins to praise God. And an incredible miracle has taken place. And that opens up a door for, once again, a message of the gospel to be preached. And as a result of that, over 5,000 men, not including women and children, over 5,000 men are now in the body of Christ. Christ. 
And so you see God in a very short time has been growing a church from 120 who are waiting on the promise to well over 5,000. And God began to move in a mighty way. The church was exploding. Now that you find in the first three chapters of the book of Acts. But when you get into chapter 4, from that point on, you begin to see persecution. In chapter 4, you see the, the apostles taken before the Sanhedrin, and they're very upset over the things that have been taking place, especially the preaching of the gospel and all. And they begin to want to command the disciples to stop speaking in the name of Jesus Christ. When you get to chapter 5, verse 17 following, you see once again they are taken and they are put in jail. When you look at chapters 6 and 7, you see a man by the name of Stephen who gives a tremendous message, and the result of his message is that he is killed, he is put to death, he is stoned. When you get into chapter 8, the very first verse of chapter 8 tells us persecution erupts, and that's what takes place. So the first three chapters of the book of Acts is filled with the wonder of God, the miracles of God, and how God is moving in the first portion. But by the time you get to chapter 4, Jesus' words are already being fulfilled. Persecution does erupt. And that you see throughout the rest of the book of Acts. Believers began to experience persecution very early in the history of the church, and that's what Jesus is preparing his disciples to expect, and this is something that they will encounter. That's why in verse 12 here in chapter 21, he says, before all these things, speaking of the things that he had looked at and was sharing in verses 8 through 11, before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And so he's saying, during your lifetime, you will endure severe persecution. And I want you to see something. We're going to look at this tonight because persecution is basically going to come from four sources. And he's going to outline those four sources for us even as we go through this passage. The first source that we find is religious authorities. He speaks concerning the fact that they're going to be uh, delivered up to synagogues. And so that tells us that it's going to come through a religious source. It's been said, a man with a message from God has to undergo the hatred and enmity of a fossilized orthodoxy. And that's what is taking place. The message of the gospel is going to cut against the grain of current religious sentiment, and it's going to be something that causes those who are fossilized in their orthodoxy to resist to the point of persecution. Now, this is something that Jesus in his personal ministry to them had emphasized. As a matter of fact, on his last night with them, he had made it clear that they would experience persecution in John chapter 16 in verse 2. Jesus said to them, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time comes that whoever kills you will think that he does God's service. Now, that was applicable at that time. We'll see this in a moment. That is also applicable in our day because there are people today who will put you to death if you were in their country as a Christian evangelizing. There's no doubt about that. We know that exists even now. And they think they're doing their God's service by killing you. Jesus said that was going to take place, and he said that in John chapter 6, verse 2. During the time of the apostles, there was a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was a man who vehemently was opposed to Christianity. He persecuted that way. He hated the Christians, Saul of Tarsus. And he speaks concerning that because he ultimately, as he was breathing out threatenings, he had received letters to take any who he had, he had discovered who were uh, believers in Christ. He had received letters of authority to imprison them, bring them back to Jerusalem, and try them as heretics. But as he was on his way to Damascus, Syria, he was on the road to Damascus when Saul of Tarsus was arrested by Jesus Christ. And we all know his story. It's found in Acts chapter 9. And that's why Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who, who, who am I persecuting, his, his response was. It's me. You're persecuting me. When you're, when you're taking out your anger on those who believe in me, you are actually raising up your hand against me. And Jesus Christ arrested him as he was on his way trying to arrest those who believed in Jesus. And Saul of Tarsus, a great persecutor of the church, became, became the great apostle of the faith. And he speaks about that in his writings in Galatians, for example, in chapter 1, verse 13 
He was writing to the church of Galatia there, and he has said, You've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And so he remembered what he did. He never forgot what he did. Jesus then stated that there would be those who were in opposition who would take you before the synagogues. They would excommunicate you. They would cause you great pain. They would even put you to death. And this is a man who was guilty of doing exactly what Jesus had said. And he never forgot what he did. And he spoke of it quite often. He understood the extreme mercy of God. He understood how far God would go in somebody's life to rescue them. He was one who was able to share about that, and he did quite often. In Acts chapter 22, verse 4, after he had been seized while preaching in the temple, well, while being in the temple, and, and he was speaking to a mob, this is what he said to them. He said, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Paul never forgot what he did. He was a persecutor of believers. That's what he did. And he said, I persecuted this way to the death. And that memory, again, never left Paul. It became for him a testimony of the grace and mercy of God. One of the more powerful places that he refers to that is found in 1 Timothy chapter 1. When he was writing a young pastor by the name of Timothy, a man who was pastoring a church in the city of Ephesus, Paul, writing to him letters relating to pastoral ministry, began to speak to him and said this to him. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief." However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I've never forgotten what I did. I've never forgotten. And I am now the extreme example of how deeply the love of God actually goes and how great the grace of God is and how wonderful his mercy is as it has been poured out in my life. Paul never forgot about that. And Jesus said, this is what's going to take place. Verse 12, chapter 21, Luke, he said, Before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So a second source of persecution is human government. You will brought, be brought before kings and rulers, he says, for my name's sake. You're going to be hated for the sake of Jesus. There are some people who are hated just for their own sake. They just don't like them. But he's saying, you are going to be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. We see that in the book of Acts. We see that when Herod reached out and took James and killed him. In Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So persecution will have a second source, and that is human government. When you read church history, and especially when you study the, uh, the book of Revelation, you discover that um, there were a series of ten Roman persecutions that the church endured. You see that Caesar Nero began the first one in A.D. 54, Domitian in 81, Trajan in 98, Antoninus in 117, Severus in 193, Maximum in 235, Decius in 249, Valerian in 254, Aurelian in 270, and it ended with Diocletian somewhere between 284 and 312 A.D. Ten persecutions that were actually government-authorized. There was governmental persecution against Christian believers. There was a bishop of the church of Smyrna. His, ma his name was Polycarp. He was a pupil of John, and he died a martyr's death. It's recorded that when he was ordered to recant his faith, Polycarp said, Four score and six years have I served the Lord, and he never wronged me. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? So he wouldn't recant, and therefore he was burned to death. 
There's a book that is called A History of Christianity. It was written by a man by the name of Paul Johnson. And he records some of the atrocities that were perpetrated on believers, the persecution that early believers endured. He writes, in the second half of the second century, Christians were systematically persecuted. This account of a massacre in the Rhone Valley is typical. Many Christians were tortured in the stocks or in cells. Sanctus, a deacon from Vienna, had red-hot plates applied to his testicles. His poor body was one whole wound and bruise, having lost the outward form of a man. Christians who were Roman citizens were beheaded. Others were forced through a gauntlet of whips into the amphitheater and then given to the beasts. Severed heads and limbs of Christians were displayed, guarded for six days and then burned, the ashes being thrown into the Rhone. One lady, Blandina, was the worst treated of all. She was tortured from dawn until evening till her torturers were exhausted and marveled that breath was still in her body. She was then scourged, roasted in a frying pan, and finally put in a basket to be tossed to death by wild bulls. These are people who endured that because of their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been esti estimated that from A.D. 64 to A.D. 312, some six million Christians were persecuted to the death. Since A.D. 33, an estimated 40-plus million Christians have been martyred. 290,000 Christian martyrs died per year during the decade of the 90s alone. If you think that persecution only occurred in the early portion of the church, it's continuing to this day. It takes different forms. There is physical persecution, obviously. There are deaths that occur because you're believers. I was reading of a young man in an African nation who uh, was a Christian. He was kidnapped and taken into slavery. And because he was a Christian, he wanted to go to church. And so he uh, snuck off and he went to a church service. And uh, the man who owns him discovered that he was gone and took him and nailed him nailed him to a bench, nailed him to a bench. I was reading of another young uh, believer in a, an Asian uh, country who was, uh, as a believer, was taken and was ordered to no longer speak openly about Jesus Christ. And, and what they did with her is they, they beat her feet and forced her to walk in her own pool of blood as they kept on beating her feet till her feet were uh, opened up, open wounds, and she would walk in her own trail of blood. And she was saying, I know that Jesus, di Jesus died and poured his blood out for me. Uh, this isn't too large a cost for me to pay. This happens all the time. These are things that are taking place right now in foreign countries. You can see that. In, in the United States, Persecution through government is undoubtedly something that's very, very real. I, I, I have a book. It's by David Limbaugh, and it's simply called Persecution, How Liberals Are Waging War Against Christianity. And you ought to read it. You ought to read the court cases. You ought to read what's being done. Uh, the little boy, I think he was eight or nine years old, who was in... in uh, in the cafeteria, he's been trained by his mom and dad to give thanks to God for uh, the meals that he has. And so he bowed his head in prayer. And as a result of that, he was told that he was taken to the principal. He was made a public example. He's nine years old. He was made a public example in the cafeteria, taken to the principal, ordered to no longer pray uh, over his meal. He went home. His parents said, do you know what God teaches us to do? Now, we're talking about nine years old. He went back and prayed again, was taken again, went back and prayed again, was taken again, and, and um, he was finally suspended for a week because he gave grace over his meal. I was reading about Christian teachers who were told you have to take your Bible and, and remove it from your desk in case somebody might see that and see that you read it. And that these are, these are things that are taking place right now. And you, you can read that. And I mean, this is a, a very thick book that is documenting persecution. And indeed, it does occur. It's happening in our day right now. And that's what's taking place. And he was saying from the very beginning, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have sources of persecution. Now, notice in verse 13 how he says, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. He's saying instead of getting upset about it, it's going to give you an opportunity to share. It's going to give you an opportunity to bear witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned to you about that healing there that took place at the beautiful gate there in the book of Acts chapter 3. When the apostles were taken before the Sanhedrin and they were being tried before them and they gave their defense, according to Acts chapter 4 verse 13, 
It says, uh, this is the result. This is what happened. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. When they saw the answer, the answer that was beyond them, when they saw the testimony that was given, they, they were amazed. And, and what was interesting is how it says that they realized that they had been with Jesus, but the fact is, is they didn't realize they were still walking with Jesus. And it was the Lord who was giving them that power and that ability. Listen, when people uh, put your faith on the line, when it's time for you to share, don't be worried about it. Don't be all concerned about it because Jesus gives us something here in verse 14. He says, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Instead of panicking, oh no, what am I going to do? And instead of panicking, we trust the Lord. And we pray and we say, God, give me peace. And God, give me wisdom. Now, one of the things that I would encourage you to right now is, very simply put, is that um, if, if you want to have uh, the words and the wisdom, it's always good to get into the Word of God. It's always good to have that in your heart. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that that's what we're to do. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, uh, the apostle tells us that we should be ready to give an answer concerning the hope that lies within us. And so we should be prepared to do that. And the psalmist told us, um, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against you. In Psalm 119, verse 11. And so spending time in the word of God is what feeds you and gives you the ability to have this answer because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. Jesus was telling us that in the book of Matthew chapter 12 when he was speaking to those who were, who were opposing him. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 and 35, he said, Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Our heart is a repository. We pour things into it. It's like that old thing, garbage in, garbage out. We pour things into us. And upon the a moment that you have the opportunity to share, you will be amazed how God will awaken your memory to the things that you read. You'll be amazed. I've had it happen so many times when I'm talking to somebody and a scripture will come to mind. And I, I, I forget that I even knew that scripture, to be honest with you. And, and I'll, I'll just share it and it just comes out and it's, it flows out because the Lord, he draws it out of you and God will do that. You'll be speaking to somebody and, and um, they'll be speaking concerning your faith in Christ and, and perhaps they'll have a disagreement with it, which is understandable. Many people do. But as you're sharing with them and as they're, as they're opposing, there you are just, just sharing wisdom that, that you know comes from above. And, and it's so good sometimes you're thinking, man, I wish I could tape this and put it on K-Wave. This is good stuff. <laughs> Boy, this is good. That has happened so many times. It's thrilling when it happens. It's so thrilling, it's so exciting when it happens to be, to be sharing with somebody or, or even sometimes having a discussion um, that, that is a, de a debate, if you will. They're saying this and, and then you have a response and, and it's not like you're making things up. It's, it's that the Holy Spirit is provoking you. He's, he's re reminding you of things that you've studied and you've read. And many times I discovered, especially prior to coming into the full-time ministry, I, I discovered that there were opportunities given to me because I'd be going to school or going to work, that in the morning when I'd read a passage and I'd meditated on a scripture, very often I would find a place that day, an opportunity to use that scripture as I was sharing with somebody about the things of the Lord. You've discovered that too if you share. If you read the Word of God and you go to work or school or whatever prepared to share and you say, Lord, here I am, use me, you'll be amazed how God gives you opportunities. And sometimes you might be that person who's thinking, I don't want to talk. I'm real quiet. I'm real shy. I, I have no desire to talk. I want to keep things to myself. I, I want to be a believer. I want to follow Jesus and all of that. But, you know, there are other people out there who've got big mouths. I don't. I just like to keep things to myself. You'll be amazed of how the Holy Spirit will use you if you simply say, but you know, Lord, my personality type is quiet. You know that. But if you use me, if you want to use me, I'm willing I've had that happen. You know, contrary to how it appears now, 
after all of these years standing up in a pulpit like this and sharing, the fact is, by nature, I'm very shy. By nature, I'm very reserved and very quiet. I've had people in our church approach me and tell me that um, they, they've talked to me outside of the pulpit and, and they thought I was kind of like cold to them. And the fact is, I don't mean to be. It's just that I'm real shy. You know, I'm just kind of a quiet guy reserved. You know, this is not the David show. I don't mean to be talking about myself to you that much, but might as well. I like it. Um, <laughs> no, but that's just the truth. You know, I'm kind of a quiet person and I'm very quiet until I have something that I feel I need to say. And so I'll do that. And I've done that for many years, since when I first got saved. Since when I first got saved. I got saved, and the same day I got saved, I heard some of the things that the evangelist said, and, and I remembered them. And I went home, and uh, my sister Madeline uh, was talking to me, and, and I started telling her, what I had heard that day. I, I just repeated what had been said to me. Just the things I'd heard. What do I know about the Bible? Never read the Bible. Tried to read it once, but I was loaded on mescaline, so it didn't really stick with me. I was, I was loaded. I was on a hallucinogenic. And I was trying to read it, and it, it made no sense, of course, and so I stopped. But I'd only tried to read it once, to my knowledge. And now... I go, I hear a message, I embrace that message, I come home, my sister Madeline and Becky are talking to me, and as I'm sharing, I'm repeating what I heard. And it's the basic things. You know, um, I was in sin. You guys know I was in sin. You know what I've been all about. But today I heard that Jesus forgives sins. And today I heard that I could have the Spirit of God in me, that I could be His temple that he'll actually live in me, that I don't have to try to be good because I'm bad anyway. And so God gave me something called grace. I remember sharing these kinds of things. And, and, I, and, and what I did is I opened my heart. I prayed, and I told my sister how it happened. I told them how it happened. I said, the evangelist, his name was Arthur Blessed. The evangelist gave, told us, if you want to be a Christian, to stand up. And, and I couldn't because I'm shy. So I prayed, and I hadn't prayed. I hadn't prayed since I don't remember. I, I, and, I, and I prayed, and I said, God, I, I, I know you're real. I know you're telling me I need to stand up, but I'm shy, and I can't stand up. I want to, but I can't. There were 4,000 people sitting on a carpet 4,000, and, and there was just no way that I was going to stand in front of 4,000 people. There's just no way. So I told God, I said, you know I'm shy, and you know I, I can't, I can't do that. But if somebody would stand with me, I would stand. And that's when Arthur blessed it. And, and I have never had a doubt that God was involved in my salvation, never. Because I prayed and I said, God, if somebody would stand with me, I would stand. And I promise you, no sooner had I finished saying, I would stand, Arthur Blessed said, perhaps you're afraid of standing by yourself. But if one of your friends would stand with you, would you stand with them? And my friend George Adams tapped me on the shoulder and he said, David, I'll stand with you if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ. That was a miraculous uh, intervention on the part of the Spirit of God into my life. I have never had a doubt that God answers prayer. I know he answers prayer. I didn't say to George, if someone stood, I didn't send a message to Arthur Blessed, say, why don't you say this, that'll get me to stand. It was, it was just the Holy Spirit's moving. It's so neat. George wrote me an email just today. He writes me sometimes. George, we stayed in contact over these 37, almost 38 years, you know, and he wrote me a word of encouragement today, which is what George does best. And that's how it works. The Holy Spirit works. He does work in your life. And, and what happens is, is these words that, that, you, that you hear, you begin to share. But if you don't have the word in you, you have very little that you can give to anybody else. And so when he says here in verse 14, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you'll answer. 
I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. He's not saying you shouldn't know the word of God. He, what he's saying is don't plan out a strategy. Just trust me. You'll know my word and I will provoke you to be able to give what is necessary at that time. Because when standing before opponents, Jesus gives words and Jesus gives wisdom. And the result, he's saying, is that your opponents will not be able to refute what you say. Now, this isn't guaranteeing that those who oppose are going to automatically become Christians. It simply means they're not going to be able to overthrow that message. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, and he was speaking to the apostle Peter, he said, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so, even though they may not agree with you, they cannot in any way, shape, or form defeat this message. It's a message that goes on and continues reaching people. Now, he goes on in verse 16, and he says, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. So, a third source of persecution comes from your own family members. It's interesting how in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36, Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, as if they need help. <laughs> a man's enemies will be members of his own household. That's true. I thought that my experience was the normal experience for all people. I got saved. My sister Madeline, after sharing that day with her, went to bed that night. After I shared on December 27, 1970, as I shared with Madeline, she went to bed that night, and she told me she went to bed, and she said, Jesus, whatever you did for my brother, would you please do that for me? And my, my mom and my dad, within three weeks or so of my conversion, I led them both to Christ. And they came to a saving knowledge of Jesus. My mom to this day, on occasion, and she does this often. I'll call her up. I call mom a couple times a week at least, and I'll visit with her. My mom lives in New Mexico. And I'll call her up. And as we talk, uh, at least twice a week, we'll speak for some time. And, and my mom often will say to me, thank you for bringing Jesus into our home. My mom does that. So I thought everybody leads their mom and dad to Christ. I thought everybody leads their sister to Christ, encourages their brother to Christ. I thought that was just natural. Everybody does that. And so when Madeline, my sister, began to date a young man by the name of Pat, and he came to the house one day, and I was the older brother. That, that gives me the honor of sitting him down. And he came into the house, and uh, we were in my parents' den and all, and, and I gave him the, the third degree, you know. Who are you and how long do you want to live? That kind of thing, you know. Don't touch my sister. We had a nice talk, and as we were visiting, I said to him, Pat, uh, how long have you been a Christian? And he tells me I've been a Christian for so long, and I said, really? I said, um, and your parents, are they Christians? He says, no. I said, your parents aren't Christians? He says, no. And I looked at him, and I thought, I wonder if you're a Christian. Because how come you haven't led your parents to Christ? Because I thought everybody did. I thought that was an automatic. I thought, you get saved, you go home, mama says yes to Jesus. I didn't know. I didn't know. That was not my experience. I didn't know that some of you go through some terrible times with family members who reject Christ who want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. I didn't know about that. I didn't have that experience. When I got saved, the whole family basically followed my, my trail. The first church I pastored was my parents and my sister. That's how it worked for me. So I thought that that was the way it is. I thought everybody, no, Jesus said otherwise. He said, no. He said, that's not the way it's going to always be. Some people have the blessing of seeing that. Most do not. And that's why he says in verse 16, you'll be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they'll put some of you to death. So the third source of persecution, your own family members. What happens today when a Jewish person comes to Christ? 
Do you think that their family gives them a party? Some places they give a mock funeral for that because this person became a Christian. And for the Jew, that automatically means you are no longer Jewish. You become a Gentile. I have Jewish Messianic friends who live in Israel, some of whom have never even told their husband or wife that they're followers of Messiah. And I've asked, why not? And their answer has been because they will immediately divorce me. That happens to this day. What happens if you're in a, a fanatical Muslim country and you stand up on a corner and say, follow Jesus, he's the truth, the way, and the life? You know, even in England, at Hyde Park, there are many fanatic Muslims. Some of you know Speaker's Corner in, in London. I've been there before. Where you can come and you stand on a soapbox and you have the freedom to speak and say whatever you want. That's what it's all. It's called Speaker's Corner. And people come and they'll speak what they want. But if you stand up and oppose Islam, there's this one guy who's been attacked and beaten several times for actually calling into question Islam when the uh, people are there preaching Islam. He gets beat up quite regularly for opposing. That happens in England. We're not talking about Saudi Arabia or Iraq or Iran. We're talking about England. That happens in various places, even in the United States. It does happen because they don't want you to come to faith in Christ. Some families are very radical in their faith and their devotion to their God. And when you come to Christ, it could mean your own life. One of the most compelling true stories that I heard in my young Christian life, I heard back in 1973 concerning a man who is a, um, who is a minister who was speaking in chapel at Biola when I was going to college, Biola University there in La Mirada. And um, he grew up on the mission field in India, and he gave a chapel during missions week. And he came and shared how that, as a young minister in India, a young man had come to him and spoken to him and said to him, I'd like to hear about this Jesus that you've been preaching. And so this pastor shared the gospel with him and gave him details concerning Jesus. And then gave him an invitation. He said to the young man, would you like to receive Christ? The young man responded by saying, you don't know what that'll cost me. But this minister said, well, I, I believe I do. And he began to share some things about dying to self and works of the flesh and things of that nature and shared for a few moments with this young man. And the young man, just looking at this minister, kept shaking his head and finally said, you really don't understand what it's going to cost me if I became a Christian. And so the minister said, well, you're right about that. I'm certain that I don't understand what costs you'll pay, but the invitation remains. Do you want to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior? And this, this pastor who was speaking to us at this chapel said, the young man looked at him for a moment and said yes. And he bowed his head there in his office, and he said, and I led him in a prayer to receive Christ. A few days later, he said a knock came at the door, and it was the local police who asked him to please go with them. They had to take him someplace. He says he climbed into the car, and we drove out of the town city limits and went to a dirt road. He said, and we pulled the car over, and as we climbed out of that car, he says, I walked up and I looked down, and there's a, 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 a tarp that's covering an object on the ground. And the police said, we needed to bring you out here to ask you if you could identify somebody for us. He said, you can't imagine what it felt like when they pulled the tarp away and there was the body with a severed head of the young man who had been in my office just a few days before. It was the young man who said to me, you don't know what it would cost me to give my life to Jesus Christ. He said, and as I was looking into the face of this man, 
who had had his head cut off. He said, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, do you believe what you told him? Because if you don't, you murdered this young man. Serious words from the Spirit. Do you believe? Because if you don't, you murdered this young man because you convinced him to believe what you yourself don't believe. Jesus said it. He said, you're going to be persecuted. This man's family was a radical family in their faith. And when he came home and shared that he had committed his heart to Christ, they cut his head off and left his body on the side of a road. That happens to this day. And that's what's being spoken about. Jesus is saying it's serious business when you follow him. In verse 17, when he says, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, the bottom line is society is also a source of rejection and persecution. He says, you're going to be hated by all on my account. Because you see, when, when you actually stand up for the truth and you speak it boldly and with confidence, you will be persecuted. There are those who may just mock you verbally, and you know, some of you in this room perhaps have experienced the physical persecution. We were in India in a small church many years ago, and during the church service, they actually have a time of testimony where people who have been persecuted that week have an opportunity to come up and share. And I remember this woman standing up with an enormous black eye, and she shared, my husband's angry at me because I'm a Christian, and he beat me just before she came to church. Her face is all swollen, and they go through that. They even have testimony time in church because of the rejection and the things that take place. Society in general will reject you. I know a man, his name is Moses Paulos. I met him many years ago. He's an Indian missionary. He ministers in southern India, and he and his son minister the gospel and they received an opportunity to go to a city. The city actually had invited them to come and preach the gospel. So Moses, his son, and a couple of other team members went to this particular city but did not know that it was a trap. When he got there, the, the people who had invited him actually took him to the city center. And in some of the villages in India, they have an old, the oldest tree is the place where they do their worship. And so they took him to the oldest tree in the city. And they tied him and his son to this tree, Moses. They took rods and they beat these two almost to death. They were passed out and they sent for a man who skins people alive. They sent him to go get him. The guy wasn't in town, so they beat him and they let him go and warning them never to come back. Moses' son at that time was a young teen. And Moses and his son healed up. And when they healed up, they went back to that town. And as they went back to that town to preach the gospel, the people saw them coming and came out rushing towards him, and they said, we have been waiting for you to come back because your God is very angry at us. And what had happened is the tree that they had been tied to withered up and died. It was the center of their idolatry. It's where they did all their sacrifices. And after they'd been tied to that tree and beaten, the tree died. And so these people said to Moses, we know we've offended your God. You have to tell us how we can make him satisfied so that he's no longer angry at us. And Moses planted a church in the city where he had been beaten almost to death. Society itself will reject you. But Jesus is saying, no, in verse 18, not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. Just remember that if the world hates you, it hated him before it hated you. Death doesn't have the final victory over a believer. We overcome even if we are put to death because no matter what the circumstances, death doesn't have victory. That's why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus. 
You see, endurance doesn't produce or protect salvation. Endurance or holding on simply evidences its reality. We hold tightly to the Lord, and that's what he's calling us to do. That's why Peter in 2 Peter 1.10 says, Give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. And so you hold fast. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what is coming. And by way of application, he's preparing us to. Because the louder you are about your faith, the more resistance you're going to have. But hold fast to the Lord and watch what the Lord will do through your testimony.